All right, so again, welcome everyone and good evening. Uh, this is Manos Prilakis and it's my great pleasure to introduce um, the webinar from Cardiovascular Innovations about management of severe calcification A to Z. This is a CME webinar. So there is actually a link at the end of the session. You can go and get CME for the case. There is uh, a phenomenal panel. We have Dr. Kevin Cross from Brigham and Women's, Dr. Ali Denkers from Memorial Hermann Texas Medical Center, Dr. Jay Cartry from Cleveland Clinic, and Dr. Asis Prasad from um, uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And this is a phenomenal group with tremendous experience in dealing with any sort of complexity, but particularly treating heavily calcified lesions. And they will share cases with us that will be discussed and feel free to put any questions you may have through the questions uh, portion of the webinar and we'll be answering them online, either online or live. Um, these are um, the companies that sponsor today's webinar, Boston Scientific, Medtronic and Philips. We'd like to thank them for the support of the webinar. And then uh, for getting the CME credit, this is the link. And that's also available at the CVI website. You can click on that at the end of the webinar and get CME. Uh, please uh, do this um, uh, quickly for the next year. So you have a full year to do that. Uh, otherwise the link will expire. So without uh, any further ado, we'll go on. Just a quick reminder that the next uh, webinar is going to be on January 14th, and it's going to be a peripheral webinar about uh, doing a, a peripheral, uh, modifying the peripheral TILA compliance during endovascular interventions. So without any, without any further ado, um, we'll uh, go ahead and uh, uh, we'll start first with Dr. Dengtes, and then uh, we will continue from there. So Ali, welcome again, and uh, thanks for uh, sharing this evening with us and presenting your case. All right, well, thank you very much, Manos. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity and uh, I'm honored to be among the uh, distinguished uh, people. Uh, so these are my affiliations. Actually, I am a professor at uh, Baylor College of Medicine and I work mainly at the vet VA but also at Memorial Hermann, as you said, and St. Luke's, and I'm also still affiliated with UT. Uh, so our, our patient was uh, a 66 year old gentleman who had cirrhosis with a MELD of 18. Uh, he underwent a TIPS procedure. He had low platelets in the 50s, INR 1.6. Uh, there's a reason I'm mentioning all those. And then he had the EKG changes on monitor, had mild elevation of troponins. And uh, this was, and then he also has had uh, moderate AS, uh, peak aortic valve velocity was 350 uh, meters per second and had a mean gradient of 29 at normal LV function. I know this is a coronary uh, thing, but we also need to uh, know uh, how the, I'm not sure if uh, you can see my uh, videos, they're playing, uh, but he had normal LV function and this is the aortic valve outflow. Perfect, yeah, you can see them, it's a little slow, but we can see them. All right, so this is the EKG pre tips and this is the EKG post tips procedure. So diffuse ST depressions with AVR ST elevation. So um, would any of you not take this patient to the cath lab? Manos, no? Did you have any chest pain or it was mainly, it was mainly the uh, EKG changes? Did you have any symptoms or it was mainly the EKG changes and the enzymes? EKG changes and enzyme and he had uh, mild chest discomfort. He did have some chest discomfort. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's pretty impressive. And I think with symptoms and this, I would personally take to the lab. I mean, do you agree? I mean, Kevin, Jay? Yes. Yeah, it's it's quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Harder to argue with that, huh? Yeah. So this is the first first picture. I'll play the uh, second second picture for clarification. Are the images a little choppy for me, or is they are everybody, or just me? They're they're choppy for me too. For some reason, they were playing smoothly just a second ago. I think uh, there's some issue with my connection. 
it looks like there's a big chunk of calcium in the left main. Correct. That's there's a big chunk of calcium in the left main. How do you know it's not thrombus though, right? How can you tell it's calcium and not thrombus? I would uh, say there's, how about this? There's a big opacity in the left main that could be calcium or thrombus. He about, cheated, he read the title of the talk. <laughs> how about that? How about this this image, uh, Manos? What do, you, what do you think? I mean, would, I don't think uh, thrombus would show like this on this. It's choppy, but let it, let it cycle, few, few, few cycles. No, but your point's well taken, Manos. You can't totally differentiate uh, uh, an, an angiographic oddity by definition could be a whole bunch of things. And I think uh, elucidation with intravascular ultrasound or some sort of imaging would help clarify that. I agree. And plus in the setting of yes and a troponin leak, I mean, although it would be unusual for a bunch of clock to be sitting in the left main. Uh, yeah, but with an ACS, you would expect there to be some sort of a thrombotic component, right? That's what I'm saying. So it's possible. It's possible. Yeah. All right. Well, point well taken. Uh, but I really didn't think it was a thrombus there at that time. So. Yeah, and I think the bottom line is, in geographically, you can be always fooled, and there's more things. But I agree with you. Um, I think Ali, you're right. I mean, this looks more like more like uh, uh, calcium in this. Yes, but I mean, I agree with your point. There you have to be no. There's no thrombus and. You may want an image, but I really was afraid to stick something uh, through there uh, with, with severe left main disease. And then look at the ostium of the right. Of course, you had to have a little more complexity. If it was just the left main, then you would be bored. So Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, we, we have to have the osteal RCA disease as well. So these are the images. Uh, so what would what would you do? I mean, uh, this is a cirrhotic man with a meld of uh, 18, uh, just that TIPS procedure and has uh, left main plus what I call left main and RCA osteal disease. Yeah, I don't know. It's Jay, I guess at Cleveland, the surgeons are the most aggressive. Uh, would the surgeons, you think, take this patient? Uh, absolutely not, no. We would be fixing this for sure. Okay, yeah, I mean, I don't think there's anyone who would take this patient with the way he's in liver, right? The liver disease and so yeah. I mean, valve plus bypass. I mean, that sounds like a lot. Yeah, no, I don't think that anybody would accept him. Uh, this would have to be done in the cath lab. All right, well, I mean, this is what uh, our surgeon said. They said, this is too high risk. We're not touching this patient. Thank you very much. Appreciate the offer. And uh, yeah, it's moderate uh, AS, left main and RCA disease, uh, also cirrhosis. There's we're like, we're not, we're not doing anything. And we talk to the patient and says, go ahead and do whatever you need to do. And if I can't make it, I can't make it, but you know, we got to try something. And one more caveat on this uh, patient. The patient is a veteran. His son is, is a Marine and was stationed in North Carolina. And he wanted to see his son before he went through the procedures, so we waited uh, for him to come over, and then my anesthesiologist was actually uh, getting impatient. Uh, we started the schedule around eleven o'clock, uh, and I specifically waited for the patient to talk to his son uh, before we actually went uh, went back into the cath lab. I think one of the things for surgery is not just a MEL score, but the INR of uh, elevation at rest. I think scares most of the surgeons in our institution and they would be seriously running away from this. With, uh, and, and actually also low low platelet count. So it's, uh, and then they will play a role in the next uh, few pictures. So just bear with me in that one. So in, in case something bad happened to this patient, I really wanted to have some support because I wasn't sure I would uh, be able to get out of it if something bad happened here. So I did use support, although one can argue, hey, there's normal LV function, but there's also AS. Uh, so, and the, the, the choice of support was for me Impella, but we also have ECMO, uh, Tandem, uh, what have you. So, uh, well, would anyone of you not use any support in this case or use some other kind of support? I would have done a right heart, and if the right heart pressures were okay and he was otherwise reasonable, 
uh, I probably would have not used support. Okay. All right. Uh, reasonable. Anybody ever uh, put a pigtail across just in case with AS, if you needed it, you get it in quickly, just sort of have it sitting there for a little bit. We've done that once or twice in our program. You know, if the AS is severe enough, you're going to kind of worry about getting in quick if things detune. And also, sometimes you have to do valvular blast to get it in, right? So that's not an option for a case of emergency. Uh, yeah. But it looked like the impeller went in. Um, Ali, impeller was yeah, went in impeller went fine. It, it was very easy to cross. Uh, the patient has moderate AS, mind you. Sure. Uh, and so we had no issues getting it in. Uh, and uh, the choice for me uh, for this, we didn't have the uh, new rotation atherectomy at that time. This is a few years old. Uh, so for simplicity reasons, I chose the orbital atherectomy at that time, and I thought I would be able to get it through. Usually would, would do a rotation atherectomy if I think I wasn't able to poke through. Uh, so I, I, my choice would be if there's some something to drill through a lesion, I would use a uh, rotation atherectomy, but here we chose orbital atherectomy. Can I ask, would anyone just balloon this and see how it goes instead of doing a primary atherectomy, or would everyone do a atherectomy up front? I mean, I think I would have at least uh, tried. I don't know if the imaging catheter would have gone, but I feel like uh, just for the reasons you mentioned earlier about just to understand the calcification a little bit better, you know, calcific mm -hmm. not versus, I know if this was a couple of years ago, all this information is new and relatively more uh, uh, contemporary with OCT data, but I would just try to get a better understanding of the type of calcification pattern, eccentric versus not eccentric, calcific nodule versus not calcific nodule, um, degree of eccentricity and percentage of uh, uh, circumferential versus uh, 270 versus 90 versus 80. So just get a better idea if I could image, but if I couldn't image, I mean, I think, I don't. I don't think. I think it's dealer's choice, orbital versus roto. I don't think just based on the imaging, I would have a choice of picking one versus the other, other than just personal preference and, and lab. What comfort. about roto size? I mean, the CSI gives you the flexibility of that larger orbit. I mean, does that come into play when you're doing a large vessel like the left vein? That's what I said. It all depends, right? Again, the qualification of the calcium makes that difference. If it's superficial, because the vessels four millimeters doesn't necessarily mean that every time you need to use a two millimeter burr to get a burr to artery ratio of 0.5, you potentially could get away with a 1.5 or a 1.75, and then subsequently follow that up with either IVL or a cutting balloon or some scoring balloon or even an NC balloon, as long as- what do, you, what do you hang your head on, the arc of calcium or something else when you image? I mean, I think several factors, right? I mean, the percentage of the percentage of the depth of calcium is, I think, more than the arc of calcium would determine whether or not you would successfully be able to expand. All you need yeah, to do is a couple that, of- That requires an OCT image, right? And can you get a good OCT image at a proximal left main? I think- In this case, you probably could, I would think, at least for where the, the lesion is. I, I tend to use the CVI, the calcium volume index score, I think that she's you know, alluding to half a millimeter thick, a couple points for either 90 or over 180, and then the length of it being five millimeters. It's, pretty, it's a pretty cool way, which you, at least correlates not, you know, mapping. If you don't, if you don't use aggressive techniques, your stent expansion is poor in that case. So um, you probably get, you know, dealer's choice too, IVIS or, or OCT in this case, both are reasonable. We, we only have the Eagle IVIS. I don't know if it would go in this case, but you know, the smaller bore high res ones probably would. Well, I, uh, I didn't think it would go through, so I really had the IVIS ready for post-imaging, but I didn't really try it first because you really didn't want to uh, make the ischemic time of that uh, ventricle uh, longer by waging a catheter in there and trying to push through. So I agree with all, all that said, but I really didn't think my IVIS catheter would fit through that hole. Sure. And one more question about how about the right? You know, some people would open the right first to just kind of make the left main safer. I mean, do, do you think about potentially doing that, or you thought it's an extra risk if something went wrong there, then you were really in trouble? Correct, because there was no surgical option on this patient. Uh, if there was a surgical option, I would go for the right first and then go for the left. If there is no surgical option, I go for the biggest bang for the buck and then move on. Sure. 
Um, so. Great. So anyway, so we we we, we did the uh, orbital hysterectomy, and we uh, we shaved off some. Did you do high speed and low speed or low speed? Uh, low speed and high speed. I must say it doesn't look that much different, but <laughs> sometimes you, know, you may modify it in, enough and you don't know that you put a balloon in. So All I wanted to do was to actually shave it off a little bit so that it becomes a little more pliable for me to sure. enlarge it. And the key is actually coming up in a second. Then we ballooned it. And the balloon seemed to expand well. What size balloon, Ali? Uh, I, I believe it was a 3.0. It was not a big balloon. I wanted to try with a small balloon and see what happens. And this is the immediately post balloon picture. Hmm. What do you all see? Ashish. I mean, there's some contrast extravasation. I'm not quite clearly can tell where it's coming from. It doesn't look uh, doesn't look pretty. Let's put it that way. Exactly. So it doesn't look pretty whatsoever. I, I saw this picture. I said, can we please uh, revisit with our surgeons, see what, what they think. Uh, they oh. said, thank you, thank you very much. Good luck uh, in your endeavors. Uh, and um, at that point, patients started having severe chest pain. The flow in the LAD went down. So now you have a patient, we, we have perforated the left vein, and now the patient is having chest pain. The flow in the LAD is gone. What would you do? Hmm. Kevin? Yeah, I mean, at this point, it's a little hard to see in the films, but I think, you know, perforated left main is our worst hazard. And I mean, I've not done this. I've only done it in a coronary model, but I'd be start be thinking about, you know, coverage stents, left main into LED, and then fenestrating out to open the circ, um, which we've successfully done with papyruses and geomeds and coronary models. It's probably a little harder to pull off in, in, you know, in the heat of the moment here. The other thing to do is if you're going to do that is to leave the circ wire in place so you can use it as a marker to poke and try to fenestrate the covered stent if that's what you need to do. You know, a balloon occlusion here is going to be poorly tolerated. You know, I think in the near term, we may have this ringer balloon that Vascular Solutions is trying to develop, which may help us to kind of at least get, you know, this tamponaded a little bit, give you some time, supply flow to the LED and see if it seals off on its own. But um, that looks like a pretty big rent from what I can see the picture. It also looks like, it, is it tracking up in the cusp a little bit too? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's so I thought we tracked back into the cusp. So basically we dissected into the cusp together. We, we, we perforated the left main. So at that time, uh, my uh, feeling was I was not going to put the cover stent across the circ and lose the whole territory. Uh, uh, but we, since we lost the flow into the LAD, oh, I teach a, a complication talks in our city a lot and I specifically say if you perforate the vessel do not stent it uh, with a non-covered stent. I stented this with a uncovered stent to establish flow into the LAD and then followed it with a uh, pericardiosynthesis and then auto transfused the patient and we did that for the next three days. We basically took blood out of the pericardium gave it back to the patient into the uh, femoral vein and the bleeding stopped in, in after three days. Oh, wow, that's a pretty impressive. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard of <laughs> this is for three days, but that's impressive. It worked, so it worked out, the patient did okay? After yeah. this realized eventually it stopped? Yeah, the bleeding stopped and we actually discharged the patient home uh, after a few days. So, uh, so the patient stayed in the hospital for a while, but uh, we, we, I'm sorry, we, we, for some reason, my, my, uh, what happened to my screen share? 
Actually, we can, we can see your screen. We can see your, we can see your screen. That's the, the video is not playing. But actually, the other thought here might have been the shortest papyrus is 15. Um, I mean, I don't know. And I, I don't, I, if I saw it correctly, the perforation was at the main, right? So if you put the regular stand in the LED, would it be possible maybe to put a papyrus in the left main alone, sticking out in the aorta a little bit, but not compromising the circ? Again, I don't know if it would have worked or not, but that may be another thought there for this. I didn't know where the perforation was, though. I mean, I, I agree the perforation seemed to be in left main, but what part of the left main was the, and whether it was going to cover it or not, I had no idea. Sure. It seemed to be more proximal, but you know, and I didn't want to put a covered stent seriously and uh, get rid of the thing, but that's a very good, good, uh, good thought. But I, we, we didn't really have papyrus. This is a few years back. Uh, so all we had was uh, the old stents. Can I ask? It's really hard to predict because these things are oftentimes quite serpiginous. It's very hard to know if there's a focal area of, it's not usually a pinhole, it's usually a rent. As was already mentioned, and it, it's often hard to know where to land the stent. So when you left the lab after the pericardiogram, when you when you did a final angiogram, so there was really no active uh, extravasation at all at the end of the uh, when he left the lab the first time. When he left the lab with the pericardial drain, yeah. we had minimal. Uh, uh, you know, I, I sucked out all the blood that I could suck out. But then I left a little bit in for a little for tamponade, and at that time we didn't see a huge extravasation uh, out. But there was still some coming out, so it was not totally you know, closed. Wow! So there was active extravasation from the left main. Minimal, point. minimal. It wasn't. It wasn't uh, into a cavity. It wasn't like a large extravasation into pericardium. How much did you wind up having to drain afterwards then? Because you left the drain in, right? We left the drain in. It drained about 300 cc's the next day, about 100 the following day, and then none the following day. How did you keep the drain from clotting off, or was it just the fact that you didn't have platelets? Yeah, we, <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the issue probably. And I actually thought about in, in, injecting platelets into the pericardial sac. Uh, it was a it was an interesting thought, but we didn't have to do it. Uh, it, it stopped bleeding for some reason. It didn't clot off. And then you know the, the pericardial effusion usually doesn't clot off unless it is uh, fresh fresh blood coming from. Uh, yeah, I think I think that was a phenomenal case, and I think hi highlights the difficult like, calcium sometimes can be really a problem and complications can happen, dissection, perforation. And that was actually a very innovative uh, solution to the problem. Actually, I would encourage you to publish this. I never heard of leaving it in and doing it so long, but it worked. So for people like this that have no surgical option, I think this is a great thing to have in mind for other operators. So maybe we'll uh, move on to the next case. So uh, Kevin Cross is going to present uh, uh, the next case. Great, thanks, Manus. <clears throat> uh, I guess you see my slides okay? Yes, yes. It's yes, now we see. Thank you. In presenter mode. There we go. Sorry. They visible? Yeah, yeah, we can see the we can see them. Great, awesome. So I named this a rock and a hard place. I did this about six months ago. A 71 year old male presented to the ER with episodic chest pain, diaphoresis at rest, slightly elevated troponin, normal LV functioning. Uh, got referred down to the cath lab. Yeah, on the I'm sorry, we actually see the PowerPoint, but it's not playing uh, in the presentation. We have two screens. We're seeing one screen, but we're just seeing the PowerPoint not playing. Oh, sorry. Let me uh, cue again. My apologies. Thank you. Um, bear with me. <laughs> oh, that's a big screen. There you go. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Is that okay? Perfect. Yeah, we can see that now. Perfect. Thank you. Great. 71, chest pain, slight elevation of troponin, normal LV. Got referred down to me on a Friday, actually going into my call weekend. I did the diagnostic at about 5 p.m. And so this is a diagnostic. Again, he's 71 years old. It shows an anomalous left coronary come from the right cusp with mild disease and a severely calcified, large, super dominant RCA. It's kind of like this functional, near functional total occlusion here 
With collateralization, you can see left to right of this PDA, which probably has some osteal disease. I'll just let that play. And so this is looking at it. So the clinical decision-making interventional strategy, uh, ad hoc PCI, yes or no, is a Friday night late about five o'clock. In a man, if you're looking at this right corner, is this a femoral or a radial case for you? You know, you know, radial, I love radial. This is not a radial case. <laughs> <laughs> it's really <laughs> funny. You that. I dragged this out of my, uh, like, you know, files of old cases to look at it. I looked at this. I'm like, oh, man, this is eight French femur all day long. I actually ended up doing a radial. I'll show you. But it's funny how even the same operator looks at one film and, like, today's assessment of it, probably because I had four awful cases, you know, the past week, I'm like, I'm going femoral all day long and I actually choose to do it radial. So I think Jay would disagree with me. I think Jay can do it radial, but I think for me, I would, I would do go femoral. <laughs> yeah, no harm in that. I looked at it the second time and said, I figured it was, and then when I actually saw a radial guy, I was surprised. So I went seven French radial eventually. Uh, you know, I, I think even though I was planning to do orbital, there's such a huge super dominant uh, right here. I decided to use a Templar. And we can talk a little bit about the crossing strategy in a second. But one of the funny things is the uh, general cardiologist on the floor was sort of squawking me a little bit about the fact that the patient had some stuttering chest pain. I was trying not to do this Friday night late going to call weekend because I knew it was going to be quite a flog. And just as we were having the conversation about when it would be done, with me certainly advocating for Monday, thank God the STEMI pager went off and I got off the hook and I was able to defer it over the weekend and the guy stayed stable until Monday. And so thinking about the crossing strategy, uh, Manos or uh, Sheesh, what would you guys take in terms of microcatheter wire? What would you look, like to do to get across this? Yeah, so I mean, I think uh, I would just at this point get a guide extension if I could approximately get a microcatheter all the way to the cap, use all my CTO skills to try to cross and use our tapered tip jacketed wire. I would probably low gram force to start with and see how that went. So Great. turn bike spiral at the cap and uh, maybe start with, uh, uh, start with a quick XT try if that buckled and didn't go, then quickly switch to like maybe a, a pilot 200 or something like that to cross. Yep, that was more or less my plan to you. And then uh, anybody favor strongly orbital versus roto in this case? Jay, what do you think? I would definitely go with roto over um orbital just because it looks super, super tight. And I think I'd want the forward cutting of the, of the roto. Awesome. All right, great. And so, and then you can see fluoroscopically here. So what I did was I deferred the PC out of Monday, put a temp wire in with seven French radial, AL1, Pilot 50 sailed through it actually, spun a turnpike LP through, put a Viper flex wire with the plan I was going to do orbital. And I've actually had pretty good luck with orbital. Even in CTOs, the only time I've had a no cross was actually in a near CTO this week, having used it many times in that case. And so despite that being a reason for, I think, choosing Roto, I've had good luck with it. We did 14 runs of orbital throughout the proximal mid and distal segment, seven on low speed and then seven on high speed. Then I thought I'd take a balloon in and try and stretch it a little bit and I was going to image it and then Immediately after seven runs of orbital, you can see that these NC balloons, and then I tried some scoring balloons, were unexpandable. So we went back down with the orbital and did nine runs on high, really extensively treating this whole underexpandable segment. And you can start to see just the cast of calcium here. And so after 23 total runs of orbital, a three five by six sculpt among a number of other balloons still had waste in them. So Ashish, what's the next step here, do you think? I mean, I think you could, you could at this point switch to roto or you could bring in a laser or you could uh, image and see if you want to go with like a 4 or a slightly bigger size balloon, depending on the size of the vessel. I wouldn't arbitrarily pick a bigger sized vessel a with a bigger sized balloon without imaging because I'm at this point a little concerned that I need to really know the size of the artery. Yeah, I agree. A 408 NC at 24 atmospheres, if that releases, it could do so and just rent the whole thing. So I think I agree with you. I thought you also type the IPL, which also I think is a great option. You know, intervascular to trips, you off label the peripheral one there might be actually a great solution to this one too. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> so we did OCT at this point, and then uh, you can see the OCT run here. Hopefully it will play. It will. And so 
I'll let this go back. You see a little bit of the guy, but effectively, not surprisingly, it was a decent amount of dissection. And uh, you can see here that despite all that orbital, there's just a huge rind of calcium that's over a millimeter and a half thick at points. I just sort of picked out the worst part of it in this still frame here. And so even after a ton of atherectomy to this point, it's a pretty big artery. I mean, the lumen sort of two, two by probably one seven here. And so I wasn't sure that a roto was actually gonna help much. Maybe a 175 burr if it wire biases might help. But with this burden of disease, I was really struggling with, you know, what the next best thing to do is having done a ton of orbital already. Maybe, you know, going eight French and getting bigger burrs like two O's would be the next thing to do. But we thought at this point, we try to do peripheral IVL. So I took a 4040 peripheral shockwave down. And despite being radial and only seven French, I actually was able to get it just far enough into where the tough part of the case was and I was having trouble releasing. And I have to say, these constrictions in the balloon surprisingly uh, released after only about 20 pulses, even though I did the full 160. And you can see on the right here, it finally looked much better than it had pre. Um, so we went ahead and then did significant uh, pre-dilation with 4-0 balloons based on the imaging. I placed four overlapping 4-0 uh, Zions DES. I post-dilated in the 4-5 and 5-0 based on the OCT. And then when I was post-dilating right in this area, I actually, the five millimeter balloon that I was working with ruptured. I sort of took a deep breath because I was expecting it might have perforated and I hadn't, the artery was still intact, but I had this weird filling defect right here. After I'd stented and after I'd posted with the five millimeter balloon, I made sure that the pieces of the balloon were intact because I took it out. And this angiography had me quite concerned. So I went back in with the OCT and I was actually quite frustrated to find that I actually had acute stent fracture uh, on a calcific nodule. Despite all this prep, it actually had wrecked the stent. And you can see here this proximal segment where the abnormality is. And I'll see if I can actually fast forward the OCT and go back and forth. Sometimes this works in PowerPoint uh, and sort of correlate it to the stills. But right about here, and I can tell you the stent clearly crosses. It wasn't that I missed landing it. It broke in the middle of it. And you can see here that there's a rind of dissection that's interesting. It doesn't play very well, kind of going back and forth. But these are only a couple frames apart. Stent, dissection, no struts, calcific nodule, and then stent distally. So I think, you know, I pretty clearly with the OCT diagnosed that I had acute stent fracture on this nasty calcific nodule that was present despite all the prep that I'd done. So I think in this case, all you can do is re-stent. They put in a 4028 science. I successfully post dilated the 5-0. And then this is the final picture of this sort of odd superdominant right in the guy with an anomalous coronary. There is disease in the ostium, the PDAs, but since they had gotten anti-grade flow, I sort of licked my wounds after several hours and was happy to have this be the final result. So rock and hard place. I think in, intervascular imaging is important to define morphology. Lesion prep is critical to optimize stent expansion. In this particular case, you know, we were able to address this with orbital high pressure non-compliant scoring balloons, peripheral IVL, and then we had this calcific nodule associated stent fracture. And I think that, you know, if you're gonna do cases like this, especially when you're having trouble, the imaging really helps you to direct the stent optimization. Thanks much, Manos, I appreciate the invite tonight. Thank you, thanks, Kevin, that was, uh, that was a phenomenal thing. Just a couple of practical points for doing peripheral IVL until the coronary gets approved. Uh, any thoughts? I know you need a big guide, so you use seven, sometimes eight is needed. Also, you can use the extens, I mean, a long wire, right, to get it down. Did yep. you have issues delivering down to the uh, to the RCA, or was it uh, delivery was okay? Yeah, no, delivery was painful. I just barely got it to that point I showed in that particular film. I couldn't get any further, and luckily there's lithotripters right at the end, and that lithotripter was right in the spot where I was having trouble dialing with the sculpt, and so I was lucky enough to get it down there. They don't fit in a seven French guideliner very well. You have to have an eight and an eight guideliner. So I've tried to jam these things down, especially in a lot of unexpandable ISR cases, and you have to have big gear. And so had I anticipated how this would be going, an eight French AL1 with an eight French guideliner would have been masterful in terms of, you know, being able to get down. And the artery was easy off the wire at that point. I kind of probably could have pulled everything out, but I was just able to get the IV all far enough where it did what it needed to in the segments that were unexpanded. Uh, and it looked worse based on the OCT. The OCT showed distally, I had a lot of good clearance and dissection. So that, I think, you know, distal to right where the IVL was, it had yielded okay. And the stent expansion and sort of ballooning wasn't a problem. It's all that proximal stuff and the real thick rind. Awesome. 
No, I, I loved it. And I must say the, the number of runs you did, the last time I did that, what I ended up doing is I broke out, I broke off the, the tip of the orbital electric <laughs> So <laughs> the, I usually stop around 10, 12 or so. I, I tried to do, but I mean, clearly phenomenal case. And I think you wouldn't be able to get actually the lithotripsicata had you not done all this uh, atherectomy. I, I doubt that the little trips, the little trips Cicata would have gone down there. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I don't have much experience with uh, with the trips other than trying to use the peripheral frequently off label. But I think, you know, even in cases like this, I'm looking forward to probably getting a number of cases. I would imagine where we have to do this hybrid approach and you know, either rota trips or orbit trips. You get enough down there. But this artery is so large with such calcium burden. I really don't know that our mechanical atherectomy devices are well suited to an oddball case like this, where it's a 5-0 vessel with a rind of two millimeters of calcium. And so we may find that, you know, using both technologies as we certainly get access to the coring one, in addition, the roto as you did here may be valuable. Let's, you know, what, what colleagues like Spratt and Colm and some CTO buddies end up doing in Europe where they have access to it already. How about the thought of, if you had say, to do it again, eight French from the groin, one five burr, two old burr, and then you think the amount of drilling needed with the orbital might have been a lot less? So, you know, I, I think what we're doing there, she says, we're hoping that the wire bias from the 2.0 is going to eccentrically shave enough let off where you can crack it well. And I mean, as recently as this week, I've had cases where I've done both orbital and roto in an artery, still had an underexpandable and actually perfed an LED trying to take a Wolverine and after all that. So, you know, I'm always, I'm trying to make an educated guess of the different orbiting mechanisms of action versus the linear with roto and whether bias is going to help me shave enough to release it. And I don't know the answer to that. I mean, retrospectively, you know, orbit, orbital didn't work well. Might Roto have, because it might curve the outer side and actually just, you know, and we've got great OCT pictures of the differences in mechanism. You know, you clearly get circumferential sanding with orbital and you'll see these big divots in the media when you do Roto. And so if it hugged the outer curve or had some bias in a way it would shave that maybe eccentrically and got just half of it carved, it may have been enough to, to get it to pop open. I really don't know. And so it's a good idea, you know, if I saw this again, I might try that because something like this didn't work the first time. So. And I would go eight French and have the ability to get the IBL further down, certainly. Great case. Very nice. Well done. Phenomenal. And uh, so on that note, let's move on to uh, Jay Cartry for the next case. Great. Um, Cold in Cleveland if you have a Patagonia jacket on indoors. It's actually, a, it's quite balmy today. Quite balmy today. Prevention is the, is the mother, right? Better than treatment, so. Yeah. You guys see my screen okay? Yeah, you can see your screen fine. Okay, great. All right, thank you, Manos, for the kind invitation. I'm Jay Katri. I um, do CTO, PCI, Compass Corning Intervention at the clinic. Um, So this is a 74-year-old patient with coronary disease, diabetes, and hypertension. He came in with a non-STEMI, uh, has a history of a prior bypass operation with Limates LED. There's a radial to a lateral marginal branch, and he has a wide graft of vein that's sewn to the right coronary artery in the diagonal. Uh, Cath showed that both limbs of this wide graft were degenerated. Um, and uh, the, the thought with this gentleman was to try to the, the graft that went to the, the right coronary artery was to a CTO. Uh, the graft that went to the diagonal was not to a CTO. The idea was to try to fix the CTO of the right and then go ahead and fix the left main into the diag diagonal and get rid of the graft altogether. Um, so we tried to do the CTO of the right, and the way the graft was inserted, it, it was just uh, basically in the AV groove of the distal right, and there was just no way to come retrograde. So we ended up bailing on that and just fix the limb to the right coronary artery off that graft, and then uh, decide to go for the left main into the diagonal. Um, so this is, um, you know, the kind of thing that happens, you do a couple of CTOs, and this is the last case of the day, and um, obviously it didn't go smoothly, otherwise I wouldn't be sharing with you guys tonight. <laughs> but this, uh, this left angiogram is uh, our target. So you can see 
just uh, moderate left main disease into this uh, diagonal, which has this uh, tight lesion in there. Uh, you know, angiographically, it doesn't look terribly calcified, but we know that there is calcium in there. Um, and then this is a shot of the uh, that Y graph. So we fixed this segment to the right coronary artery. And you can see the way that this graph was inserted, there was really no way to come up retrograde to fix this native right. So we, we ended up just having to fix that limb. And so now we're just working, we, we, instead of fixing this segment in the Y graph to the diagonal, we decided to fix the native diagonal, um, thinking that that'd be a little bit more durable. So this is, this is what happened. Um, the first thing that we did was uh, pre dilate with a 2515 NC. And then we ran a 125 rotaver through there and then used a series of balloons to do uh, additional pre dilatation. And so this is uh, finally with a 3 by 20 NC. You can see a persistent waste in that balloon. So honestly, I was a little surprised. I really didn't expect to see this. I figured between the angle and the wire bias that, you know, a rotor bird should have been able to take care of that, but it didn't. So then we went back in with a 175 burr and uh, used a 3 by 15 cutting balloon followed by a 3 by 8 NC balloon. And you can see, despite doing that, uh, there's still a persistent waste. We can't get that area to expand. Um, so what would you guys do at this point? Ashish? Image, image. I think the key here is to see what the story is. I want to know what's the cause of what's going on. Great. So this is the imaging. Thank you. Uh, so right in the left panel the, is... Um, okay, David Zalberg, I think you knew the image already. You're going to be a circle of why. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the left panel is the left main. You can see it's, an, it's, a, you know, it's got some mild disease in it, but otherwise okay. Uh, this is the area that just would not expand. You can see that there's absolutely no rays of sunlight anywhere. So this is all attenuation from a concentric ring of uh, calcium. Obviously, you can't tell the thickness of the calcium like you can on OCT, but just that absence of daylight would suggest that this is a dense concentric ring. And the, the way the... What's that? Like a fracture at three, or am I imagining? At three o'clock? Well, I mean, I think that there's maybe a little ray of sunshine here, but I don't know if this is... I, normally, you can see light all the way out to here when you've got a fracture. And I, I don't see that. Okay. Um, and, and certainly the balloons would suggest that this isn't expanding, right? And then this is the distal target. The distal target looks nice and healthy. How big was um, the distal I can't see the image because of all our photos. Like 3.5, right? At least a 3.5. Yeah. yeah, big. It looks like a nice big artery, right? One, mm -hmm. two, three, almost four mm -hmm. distally. So um, since, we, since we couldn't get uh, the 175 bird to do anything, we decided to go ahead and do uh, um, off-label um, lithoplasty using a peripheral balloon. Um, so we, we did have two catheters in because we were trying to do a CTO originally. So um, I re-engaged the left main with an A-French guide and we crossed uh, with a 300 centimeter grand, grand slam wire and unfortunately, that night, all I had was a 3.5 by 60 shockwave. That's all that we had in the room um, available to us that night. Uh, so I'll play this for you guys and um, see what you guys think. So this is, this is the, the very first inflation. Now, he's got a patent but degenerated graph of the diagonal, so I didn't really worry about, you know, ischemia. I just went ahead and did the, the 30 pulses that the peripheral device will give you. And you can see um, it's already starting to give here and the fellow's getting pretty excited that we've, we made the right decision here. And then right here towards the end, you can see the balloon looks very good. And so it's about to finish up his 30 pulses. And um, then this happens. Agony. <laughs> wow. So, uh, you know, at it, it's funny. Here, right? At four What's atmosphere. that? At four atmospheres, just very low pressure, right? And still. Yeah, yeah, just four atmospheres. Because as this is going up, the fellow and I are talking. He goes, you know, as soon as we did, do these 30 pulses, we'll turn, we'll, the generator will turn off and we'll go to six atmospheres and then lower the pressure again and give more pulses if we need to. And that's the conversation we're having just as this about, this starts to happen right here. I, I can um, so, say, I, 
I rupture these at least 30% of the time using off label Macori. I don't know if I haven't learned how to use them correctly yet. I mean, by taking them down, you clear the air, which apparently preserves the balloon, but it happens more than you'd hope, certainly. And I don't know if the coronary device is any better, but um, hopefully it is and look forward to using it because it may make a lot of this easier. I mean, I think that the issue here is that, you know, in the periphery, they're larger diameter. So the relative distance from the, the elements to the, uh, the wall, the balloon is farther. Yeah. So in a, you know, a small diameter balloon, that energy probably has a better chance of hitting the wall of the balloon. I would assume that that's the problem here. But, you know, when I, when I tell the rep I keep rupturing the balloons and the corner, I guess what they tell me, don't use them in the corner. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it's you, uh, that there are you know, quite a few reports on the uh, balloon rupture on these, uh, as, you know, even to, from Europe as well. Yeah, and maybe yeah. we're just asking this device to do stuff it's not built for until we get access to the correct one, so. Yeah. I guess the so other at, side is it's very long, right? As you say, you only had this one, so it's very long, so it's extending way back. So maybe that played a role in the in the rupture and the dissection, because normally you wouldn't have dissection uh, otherwise, but this is so long, maybe that's part of the reason. Yeah, and the, so for the team knows, I think if I recall, these, these I, don't, I don't do tavers, so I don't use them much, but there are two sizes on our shelf. You have to make sure you take the longer one, which I think is 135, there's two shaft lengths. If you take the short one for iliacs, it's gonna to be tough to get it to deliver all the way, depending on how far you have to have it. So it's just, if you're gonna yeah. try to do this off at home, but granted it's all off label, you gotta make sure you're using the right device. Otherwise you're gonna to have to shorten your guide. Yeah, so this is a tibial device. So it comes in the 135 shaft line. Great. Um, yeah, so so what, what would you guys do at this point? I mean, hope that you got enough pulses, take an NC balloon down and make sure it releases. But first take a puff, make sure you don't have a perf from the balloon rupture. But I think it looks pretty like it just went back into the order. It's probably OK. So I didn't take any puffs because I had this stain. Um, <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> well that's pretty, pretty bad. I, I, guess I had that second guide there. <laughs> I, I had that second guide there, so I went ahead and engaged the left main with the second guide, and I took the uh, the uh, syringe off my manifold so we couldn't accidentally inject this thing. Mm -hmm. um, thankfully, he was pretty stable. I mean, he he was pain free, and there was no electrical or hemodynamic instability. So we got an echo. Uh, the echo didn't really show anything, but you can see this stain. It's there. Um, so we just kind of kept working, hoping for the best, um, because the stain wasn't really getting any worse. It just, it's the stain from the, the, the dye that was in the balloon and it's not washing away. Um, so I figured at this point, as long as we don't inject, we're not going to propagate this thing and we can just finish. Uh, so what we did is, um, just did, I just got a PCI deployed our stents according to, um, the dimensions that we got off the IVIS post dilated the, the distal stent to three five like what the IVIS had indicated and post dilated the left main up to five and then I took the angiogram the completion angiogram is actually shot through the vein graph so you can see it's backfilling the diag all the way to the left main ostium and everything looks okay and there's some there's some reflux of contrast uh, into the aorta and I left it at that and uh, we sent them up to uh, the step down floor um, had a had a formal echo done the following morning. His EF was good, no aortic insufficiency, thankfully. There was at least a moderate pericardial fusion that was, uh, you know, biased towards the atrial side, but thankfully no tamponade physiology. It developed pretty intense pleuritic chest pain and ended up having to stay in the hospital for that. He also developed some rapid AFib and we had to put him on amiodarone. Um, and unfortunately, that persisted for several days. They ended up having to put them on a NOAC despite this small aortic dissection. Um, but thankfully, he did okay. He got out of the hospital, um, had, a, had a zio patch placed, and uh, uh, eventually was confirmed to have resolved his AFib, came off the NOAC and the amiodarone. Uh, saw him for follow up just a few weeks ago. He's, he's pain free, he's doing okay. Um, but, you know, a lot of. Uh, a lot of consternation and pause with, with all these great tools and toys that we have to deal with calcium. I, I don't know that we necessarily have, have the uh, ultimate recipe figured out just yet because we can still do some pretty incredibly uh, dangerous things with these tools. Um, but thankfully he did okay. I, I don't know exactly what I learned from this other than the lithoplasty is not as benign as we were hoping it was gonna be. 
Well, I guess part of this retrospectively, right? If you knew this, would you have done the vein graft? <laughs> Did the vein graft lesion after all? <laughs> yeah, well, that's what that's what my partners asked me. I, I, I still think that this is probably better, you know, um, but a lot of it, you know, I, I think is colored by the fact that we initially had scheduled them for RCA, CTO, PCI, and we, we failed pretty miserably on that. And I think some of that frustration plays into, you know, we're not gonna give them a, a second rate result here. We're gonna get that native fixed at least on the diag, uh, that, that definitely played a role in our decision. But I think that um, uh, if you can get a native fix, it's probably better than messing with the main graft. Yeah, and actually there is uh, Paul Canapen from Amsterdam. They're running a trial called Proctor in which they're randomizing patients with vein graft lesions to either fix the vein graft or fix the native. But I think, you know, sometimes it's a clear cut. You can fix the native much better, no, no question about it. But sometimes the native can be tricky. And I guess your case just illustrates that it's not always a slam dunk and the native can be a very tough one to fix. So uh, it's not as clear cut an answer as one might want to have. But again, beautiful case. I think what you learn is complications can happen with everything. And I think we have a lot of things to learn with IVL when it becomes more uh, available, I guess, in the coronary world and more widespread used. And also the other point, uh, Manos, is that not all vein grafts are the same either. There are degenerative, nasty vein grafts. And on the other hand, you have a focal type A lesion in a vein graft with brisk PIMI flow that's been open for 18 years. It doesn't make sense that every vein graft be treated with the same degree of disrespect like a degenerative vein graft needs to be. Yeah, absolutely. All right, and then last but not least, so Asis Prasad will present the last, uh, the last case for the evening. And thanks again. That's very a lot of a lot of learning. I think I really love all these cases. It's been a lot of uh, great learning points and things we'll probably encounter tomorrow in the cat lab. Yeah, no, sir. hopefully not. <laughs> what you treat calcium, you're going to run into this. That's just the fact of life. So if you this is just one of those things that uh, you'll have to reconcile. It's you know everybody that's listening in. Uh, you know if you haven't used a papyrus, if you haven't uh, drained a pericardium. If you haven't dealt with the left main dissection, if you then you haven't treated enough calcium. So I think it's just uh, part and parcel of the work we do. But but to the to point, you know, these courses are great. And thanks again, Manus, for putting it on because you don't want to figure out how to treat one of these things the first time you see it. And so you know, if you've seen a couple of friends show the gray hairs that they have, including me, have come from something. At least you have a little bit of preparation for you know. I remember Manos exploded a left main when he was on that WebEx four or five months ago. What did he do? Because I got to move really quick now. So I think, you know, one of the neat parts about being part of these sorts of things is you start to prepare yourself for when the rare and uncommon thing, which is disaster happens, you can kind of have your preconceived notion of, all right, this is the steps to deal with it. And we all learn together that way, which is why these are so fun. Yeah. What I've learned is that I can drain a pericardium for three days. <laughs> exactly. But it won't yeah. cut off. And, and, and then get away with it. That was the most amazing case of the day. To me, I'm still, I still can't get over that. That's incredible. Make sure you have a good interventional fellow. Otherwise, you have to be there the whole night. No, actually, I had a very good fellow, and she, she drained that pericardium uh, intermittently. That's great. So anyway, so welcome to this last case. It won't be that long, I promise. I'll get done within the time frame. We've all heard all these problems with calcium, you know, bad stent delivery. We've talked about all this stuff related to edge dissections and complication rates we've seen that are high and then increased rates of uh, restenosis and thrombosis. So my case is, you know, pretty simple and straightforward. Two case examples I wanted to present. One on the left panel, one on the right panel. One is what not to do, and the one on the right is how to handle the situation correctly from the get-go. So let's start with the panel case on the left, which is a uh, right coronary lesion in an elderly female who had come in with an ACS that was enzyme negative. Uh, it was after hours, and I remember uh, my fellow uh, got access, and we were getting ready to start the case, and I got pulled away into something else, into another room. And so he uh, was almost uh, close to finishing up the fellowship. So we just sort of said that he could continue working uh, while I came back. And so we ended up, you know, he ended up doing a two five balloon and then he thought the balloon adequately expanded and then ended up putting in a three oh proximal right coronary stent with no imaging and, and nothing. And the next thing you know is I walk in and I see this uh, picture on the right. 
What do you guys see? Oh, unexpanded stuff. Yeah, yeah. huge waste. <clears throat> right in the middle of that mid RCA, and we have yeah. a fresh white stand. So you graduate. Go ahead. Your fellow graduate. I let him graduate. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I come back in and I'm like, okay, so we have a freshly deployed three millimeter drug eluting stent in the proximal right corner. What are your treatment options? Well, the best thing is uh, ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. And the lesson learned that I highlight is take orthogonal views of the pre dilatation balloon, image prior to deploying your stent, don't undersize your pre dilatation balloon and talk yourself into believing that you're fully expanded. And if you don't plan to image the vessel, make sure that your balloon size is at least one-to-one -one based on what your angiographic assessment of the size is. If you are gonna use an NC balloon, use a short NC balloon and size it one-to-one. -one. And if the balloon will cross, if my majority of the times, if there's a lot of calcium, it'll answer will be the balloon won't cross and you're not gonna be able to take care of it this way. Of course, IVL is an option outside the US or you can use a uh, peripheral balloon that. Fred J and Kevin used. Uh, role is unclear, but obviously seems promising. But what I chose to do was uh, get on the, uh, the laser bandwagon with a Turbo Elite uh, laser that's a peripheral laser. We usually set it at 80-80 fluence and energy, and we prepared for a bunch of no reflow. You run for several minutes, and hopefully that solves the problem, especially in freshly deployed stents. So in this case, you can see in the right panel, the uh, laser initially has trouble getting past that spot. And we use laser on contrast, of course, uh, create the microcavitary uh, bubbles that are able to get behind this freshly deployed, under deployed stent. And you can see that uh, the, the, the laser uh, finally makes that bend into the descending RCA and uh, the in injecting contrast over three to five minutes, we're able to uh, get the balloon uh, fully expanded on the right side. And we thought we were done. But sure enough, you know, you have a mid RCA dissection with all the injections and uh, the laser run. And now the dissection is extended past the stent as we ended up having to then uh, extend stenting further down and then all the way further past the descending right to the bear getting past all that calcium because the whole vessel was calcified and probably would have been uh, better treated with uh, atherectomy up front, which we chose uh, mistakenly not to do, and ended up uh, getting another edge dissection downstream. Finally tacked it all up, used image guidance, and was able to get a pretty decent result. As you can see, the right is big, and there's distal downstream disease in both the PL and the PDA. We chose to leave that alone. On the yeah. other hand, what's that? If you had a crystal ball, I bet you wouldn't have started with the JR4 guide. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. You know, the lesion was fairly proximal though. Yeah. Uh, I think you need a whole lot of support. With a guide extension, you should have been okay. Yeah. But still, it's clearly not the right option, right? Yeah, I know. Once you realize you're delivering downstream for the proximal portion of it, it's fine. Just you never thought you'd probably have to go more than 30 millimeters in. And then after all that bad stuff happened, it's painful. <laughs> exactly. And then you're chasing yourself down. And, yeah. and then, like, uh, Sis, did you have any ST elevation? I know five minutes of laser, that's. That's quite a bit. Did you have any ST elevation cases uh, from putting so long? Uh, yes, no, he had clearly ST elevation. She clearly had chest pain. Hemodynamically, she was fine. Uh, left side wasn't that bad. So she tolerated it okay, but it, and we had to give a bunch of nitrite at the end through a microcatheter to combat no reflow. It was very common when you end up using these long runs with laser. And so. Uh, it's one of those you use the, use the 0.9 laser because it's more crossable or would there be any advantage using a 1.4 laser? No, so I think the 0.9, no, we could use the 1.4 laser, but I think the, even the 0.9 laser was having a hard time coming across. And, and I think the 1.4 laser probably would, wouldn't have crossed. Uh, but I think your point's well taken. In hindsight, probably you could have used both the 0.9 and then gone back in with the 1.4 instead of continuing to stay with the 0.9 for as long as I did. If all things were equal, do you think a 1.4 is more effective for this application than a 0.9? Will it deliver a bigger bubble or more energy behind the stent struts? Yeah, I we, we, I'm sorry, Kevin, I don't know the answer. You're going to say yeah, something. we talked to the Phillips engineers about it. I keep trying to ask them to give us a matrix of some teaching tools, but lasering off la laser on contrast is off label. And so trying to get the company to support the research and publish it in a compliant way, which allows us to understand the 0.91417 laser on saline versus contrast 
the magnitude of atmosphere's energy and then compare that to shock wave would be really helpful because we know that shock wave in a single blast is about 50 atts. And so um, we're trying to get it like in part as a safety messaging. You, know, you don't laser on contrast with a one four wink wink because this is how much atmospheres it gives. You should do it on saline because it's safer. But there's a yearning for that information, Jay. We just don't have it right now. But there, there is more energy and presumably, you know, when you go from 0.9 on saline to 0.9 on 100% contrast, it augments the acoustic mechanical effect by a factor of four. And there's more laser fibers in the 1.4. So presumably it's a lot more than a 0.9 on contrast. We just don't have numbers yet. We're hoping to get that soon. So from what I understand, the 0.9 will deliver, you can set it higher than you can a 1.4, correct? Yeah, the, it's 80-80 on the 0.9, it's 60-40 on the 1.4. And so some of that is just governed based on the way it was approved initially. And so the, the energy halo of the 0.9 isn't that much smaller than the 1.4, just because you mm -hmm. can't send as much power to the 1.4. But the 1.4 has more forward, like, what's the most power. What's the most useful thing? Like the, the, point, the 0.9 is far more deliverable. And is it really giving up much to a 1.4? Yeah, so what we'll do is we usually image it. At the, you know, you won't be able to get a 1.4 through a stent that's underexpanded that's 1.7 or smaller. It just doesn't pass. And so typically I'll do an OCT to see what the minimal stent area, not the new minimal area, you know, it's always smaller than that, but see how big the stents are. If it's 1.7 or bigger, I'll go with the 1.4. If it's 1.7 or less, I'll use a 0.9. Sometimes you go from, sometimes you have to use both, I think as you're suggesting. So we will, we will use two laser fibers in these cases if the first smaller one fails. I have, my experience has largely been, I've, I mean, I've probably had not acutely in the setting of a couple of, uh, in the same, but I've done, as most of you have probably, several cases of these underdeployed stents uh, over the last year. I've never had to step up to a 1.4. I've successfully been, man, been able to expand, I would say, 95% of these with like a 0.9 on contrast. Mm -hmm with or without IVL adjunctively. Yep. So on the other hand, this other case, you know, it seemed a little bit more, uh, you know, involved. We were able to get a guideliner down after we basically used a 1.5 and a 1.75 blur, literally took us 10 minutes and uh, were able to uh, implant a stent successfully without any problem. So I think the lesson to me has always been uh, you know, thinking about this, when you think about using an atherectomy device and you see calcium, not using it in the hope of a shortcut is the fastest way to prolong your procedure. And again, you're able to deploy a 38 millimeter stent, whereas you have to struggle with multiple layers of a shorter stents in that previous case. And you ended up having to treat the left main and add the versatility to be able to easily do all that because we had a, a good imaging guided optimized stent result uh, from the get-go uh, to treat the LAD. Thanks, Jesse. And there was one question that came up about high pressure and C balloon for the first case, the under expanding. I presume you did that right before you went to the laser. Yes, yes, of course. We, I mean, I used a 3.5 balloon and, and there was no chance of that working. And I think sometimes the, the lesson for me has been for this case is that sometimes the angiogram, even the balloon inflation can be deceiving. The balloon might seem okay, then you put the stand and then you image, then you realize, oops, you just have a waste. Actually, I think for this case is maybe upfront imaging before you put the stand might be a little safer way to make sure you don't have a stand under expansion. But all the lessons you just brought up are very, very good. Yeah, oh, I mean, totally, because you know the, the teaching is, oh, I'm gonna test it with a one-to-one -one size balloon see if it releases, and if it does, I'm gonna put my stent in. But we know from like Light Lab and a bunch of the other imaging studies, our ability to angiographically gauge the size is way off. Right. So that one-to-one -one balloon is fool's gold. You're taking an inexact predilation size and you're probably off by, and I usually undersize stuff, at least my own personal data from some of these imaging programs we've been part of. And so I don't know what a one-to-one -one size balloon is, especially in a case like that. So in, in on the back end, if you're gonna take if you're going to try an NC balloon at 26 atmospheres off label, if you're more than one to one, you're going to rupture the artery. So the imaging to both prevent and then remediate on the back end is important. And so, you know, someone asked about high pressure. I'm okay going to 26 atmospheres, but it better not be more than one to one ratio because those are the times you perforate the stent. Mm -hmm. and, and to be honest, those perforations are far more, far more catastrophic because you basically rented a big hole in the vessel 
And in those cases, a single papyrus may not even be enough. You may need yeah. two or three layers of covered stents to save the situation, or a lot of the times ending up sending the gaze to surgery. So this business of high pressure balloon as, a, as something that's safer is such a myth that I think we need to do a better job in dispelling it. Yeah, you, do you know, guys have uh, do you guys have anything that you could tell the audience or, or the panel about what what do you look for on the post atherectomy imaging to suggest that you've adequately prepped the lesion? Kevin, you want to take that, or do you want me to take it? Or? Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to use OCT preferentially, uh, and you know, if you see fractures of calcium in the near portion that you know goes you know a quarter to half millimeter thick in a couple areas. That's typically commensurate with getting good expansion of the stent. And so the question then becomes, you know, how much iterative imaging, you know, image first, atherectomize, and then you do intercurrent imaging and determine if you prepped it well enough. I think, you know, it, late at night in the STEMI, you know, sort of in cases where I want to be expedient, if I know that I'm one to one size with the balloon I'm dialing with, dilating with, and it goes up well, that's sort of a poor person's way to do it. But if there's any question like the case I showed, you know, trying to understand what's going on and in that case, clearly showed there were no fractures, that I was never going to get a stent expanded until we did something to remediate it. And so the other thing is, you know, to Shisa's point, if you've got an underexpanded stent, you take a, a balloon to 30 atmospheres, the laser is actually safer because that acoustic mechanical energy has been shown by OCT in cases like he showed, we others, multiple case reports, you see these calcium fractures. And the number of those fractures behind the stent structure more and deeper if you laser on contrast. And so it's actually more controlled and more safe to do the calcium modification with the laser than it is to just take a one-to-one -one balloon up to some crazy atmosphere, blow a hole in the artery, which is stented open, and then that's really tough to deal with. So I would argue that the laser is probably the safer way to go. Although it's expensive, you got to wait five minutes to turn it on. It's probably what we should be thinking of in these cases where you have acute stent regret. And actually, Jerry, to answer your question, you know, uh, there was a case actually that uh, was done yesterday. I was watching on uh, uh, on Wonder Medical uh, that you know Julian Strange and, and the guys from uh, from Bristol and uh, uh, the UK were demonstrating a uh, uh, calcium uh, webinar with uh, uh, management of calcium uh, just yesterday, and it was interesting to me was. In that it was an osteal circumflex lesion, heavily calcified, you know, 25, 30 millimeter lesion. And he ended up, literally we measured the number of times he used IVIS seven times during that case. Mm -hmm. So I think the days in the past when we just used to throw in an IVIS to determine whether or not we should, we should actually, um, uh, you know, atherectomize versus not atherectomize or at the end of the case, to test the adequacy of just the stent is so old school because I think that it gives you real time feedback during the case. And I was amazed that he literally had done six runs of IVIS at different times before, during, after ballooning, after the atherectomy, after the stenting, before the stenting to allow him to iteratively make changes. And in some cases that extra time spent doing the IVIS saves you a whole bunch of guesswork that you would otherwise have to do if you didn't do it. So it's really- Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I, I've gone full circle. I, I use intravascular imaging all the time. I use more intravascular imaging a week than I probably used in a year of practice five years ago. So I've come full circle. I'm curious if anybody has any thoughts on what would be a warning sign on imaging to suggest that a complication is impending. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I gotta say calcific nodules scare the heck out of me. And, you know, I, I think many people agree orbital is a better technology for that. I don't know that we have a, a firm enough experience, but I think, you know, a little bit of the group think in, you know, cases where by going in 360 degrees, you can probably shave that if the roto wire bias isn't favorable. I started to take, you know, eccentric nodule I wanna modify has become an orbital problem for me in the, in the most recent era. Um, you know, remains to be seen as I apply it there more, but those are, they're tough to modify. Your stents look terrible. And if you get it wrong and you're under expanded, you go high pressure, that's when you rent the artery. And so, you know, I, I think they're bad actors and trying to, you know, iteratively modify them is something that I look to do with serial imaging. And 
And that's a case where it's tough to know the thickness of the biitis. I think there's a real advantage to OCT in those cases because measuring how much, how thick they are and how much you've changed it is kind of what I'm looking at when I think about when it's time to actually put the stent in. Mm -hmm. Have you guys applied roto or orbital in those cases? Something on a, an eccentric, eccentric calcific nodule scared the living daylights out of me. That well, I showed it in the in the you know, in the first case. So it was an eccentric calcific nodule that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. It so went send them to, to, to Dektas, please. Everyone has a eccentric calcific nodule. Please send to Houston, Dr. Dektas. <laughs> <laughs> she has experience with the long term pregnancies. <laughs> but again, thanks, sir. That was a great webinar. Just to finish it up about the OPN, there's a high pressure balloon in Europe. As far as I know, there is no soon coming this coming soon in the United States, unless anyone of you knows that of the balloon coming to the US anytime soon. We keep asking every CMO of every company we talk to to get it here for us, but no one's bit yet. <laughs> so anyway, so it's a, a, for European audience, you know, it's an option, but unfortunately for the US, not here yet. I know they have very good results. They can go to 40 atmospheres plus and they can really crack a lot of those calcified. But I think, again, we're a few minutes past the hour. I would like to thank everyone for a tremendous uh, case presentations and tremendous discussion. I would like to also thank, uh, again, our sponsors, Boston Scientific, Medtronic, and Philips, and all of you in the audience that uh, participated. This will be posted online for people who weren't able to see it live. And again, for CME, there will be a link on the CVI uh, webinar. So again, thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks, Aziz, Kevin, Jay, and Ali. And thank you all again.